The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon to everybody here on the East Coast, and good morning to everyone in other parts of this great country of ours. My name is Patrick Anderson. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, as you know, or at least as I hope you guys have uh, figured out, we're going to be talking about uh, TrimTech this morning slash this afternoon, which is um, our novel shrub growth regulator product. Um, really cool, has a lot of great benefits, and we'll cover on all that today. Um, as a quick note of housekeeping, uh, this webinar is worth one ISA CEU. Um, if you did not put in your um, ISA CEU number when you registered for this event, if you go over to this little icon here on your screen and click on that little arrow, that will expand this whole window here. Um, and in the chat area, you can put in your CEU code now or you know, your ISA number there. Um, likewise, if you should have any questions throughout the broadcast, uh, go ahead and type into that question panel and we'll get to those at the end of the uh, session today. Um, assisting me today is Matt Karst. Uh, Matt's up there in uh, Minnesota at our home base uh, and I'm down here in lovely North Carolina. Um, my name again is Patrick Anderson. I'm an arborologist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. I'm based out of the Southeast in North Carolina. Um, and there you can see my information there. If you have any questions about any of this stuff um, in the future or, or whenever, please feel free to reach out there. Um, we're always happy to hear it from you. And of course, you can always visit our website at treecarescience.com. And we always have our live tech support line, that number right there where you will always get um, well, most of the time during business hours, you get a live human being there to help you with your product and rate questions, pricing questions, things like that. So great. <clears throat> and one quick reminder also, if you're not familiar with saluting branches, we're going into, um, I believe, our fifth year now. Uh, we're going to be participating this year on September 18th. Uh, we have Veterans Affairs Cemeteries all throughout the country. Um, so no matter where you are, you should be able to find an area to sign up. It's a great day of service, great way to give back. Um, if you want to sign up or learn more, go to salutingbranches.com. Um, and again, if you have the time and are interested, I'd highly encourage everybody to participate. It's a really, really good time. So as you know, Rainbow Scientific, we are based in research and science. Um, just I always like to go over some of the things that we've done over the past year or so. So just as an example, um, last year we did over 150 replicated research trials throughout the country on everything from scale insect protocols to plant growth regulator protocols to improving equipment. Um, we work with a lot of different research institutions um, so we're always constantly looking to improve upon, um, you know, what we offer and improve, you know, our industry as a whole. Um, you know, we really strive to bring the science to tree and shrub care. Uh, we've created over 160 protocols for managing trees and shrubs in the landscape. Um, we have comprehensive white papers. We do in-field um, classroom testing, training. Um, we offer certification credits, we have for diagnostic guides, and we really just want to be a partner with everyone out there in the industry uh, to help uh, manage trees and shrubs out there in the landscape. And I always like to show here our company values. Uh, again, we're going to be talking about trim tech today. I'm going to show you some really incredible pictures. We're going to learn a lot about this. Um, and so I just want everyone to know, as always, is that you know we're science-based. Everything we see here today is going to be based in peer-reviewed science. Um, we're accountable to what we say, uh, and this honesty and integrity. Again, we're going to see some really cool pictures. We're going to learn a lot about trim tech, um, and just to let you know that, you know, again, we're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Um, we have some really cool things that we can offer and help you guys out that are in the field. So with that, let's get started here. Um, so our intended outcomes for this afternoon slash this morning is we're going to learn what is trim tech. We're going to look at some growth control results. We're going to learn a little bit about how trim tech works. We're going to look at how it can help plants from a health-wise, so the secondary uh, plant benefits. And then finally, we're going to go into how trim tech can save you time and labor when it comes to um, shrub pruning out there in the field. And again, at any time, if you have any questions, please put your questions into that box. Uh, and then Matt will read the questions um, as we conclude here this afternoon. 
So TrimTech has been researched for over a decade. It is a, um, it's intended as a foliar application, a foliar type two plant growth regulator for ground covers, vines, perennials, and shrubs. Um, we'll also look, there is some label um, information there about doing some soil applications, um, specifically for vines, and we'll look at that as we go forward. Um, but again, this is a foliar applied type two plant growth regulator. It's the only foliar applied type two plant growth regulator labeled for landscape plants, which is one of the reasons why it is such a neat tool that can be used within the, um, the industry here. Uh, again, with TrimTech alone, we've done well over 300 at this point now, probably closer to four or 500 um, research trials with TrimTech starting back in 2004. So TrimTech, is, we've been using it for a while. We've been researching it for a while. We brought it onto the market in 2008, 2009. So it's been on the market now even for a while. We have a lot of great research, a lot of great background with this product. And again, we have partnered with a lot of different research institutions and companies to bring about a practical protocol so that you can use this product. Uh, and again, you can see here, we've even published uh, work here. This is with Dr. Smiley, Dr. Frederick, and Liza Holmes at the uh, Bartlett Tree Research Labs there. So let's just jump right into, you know, some of our expected growth control results with TrimTech because this is by far some of the coolest stuff that we're looking at. So if you have aggressive growing species out there on your landscapes that you need to manage for your clients, this is by far going to be one of the best uh, tools you have. So if we look here, this is an example of Ligustrum. Um, this is wax leaf privet is another thing to call it. Um, this is two months after treatment. You can see here are untreated versus are treated here. So you can see the difference in growth here that we've seen over a two month period. This is another example. This is the same plant. If we count back five internodes, one, two, three, four, five, count back five internodes, you can see the difference in growth control here between our treated and our untreated. So we have just phenomenal results when it comes to managing growth. This here is another trial in Texas, um, in Houston. This is um, climbing fig or fig ivy, depending upon what you want to call it. This is done as a soil application with TrimTech. So here you can see our untreated versus our treated. We're reducing the amount of that outward growth of that vine. And more importantly, for this specific area, reducing the amount of these escapes that are getting up onto this area. In this case here, we wanted to maintain this vine below this area here. And so we were able to drastically reduce the number of escapes in that case, which of course reduced pruning and kept folks off ladders for a longer period of time. As we move now over here into the Southeast, we have Burford Holly. Burford Holly is super commonly planted throughout the Carolinas and Virginia, as well as other parts of the country. And so we can see here, this is 14 weeks after treatment, the difference between the untreated side versus the treated side. Again, significant reduction in growth over, in this case, here, a 14 week period. Here we look at Laura Pedlum, another aggressive plant growing throughout the southern part of the United States for sure. This here is comparing a type one plant growth regulator, which we'll talk about in a little while, compared to TrimTech, our type two foliar applied plant growth regulator. And again, you can see the difference here. This is over an eight week period, the reduction in growth that we're seeing here. It's pretty phenomenal. Moving even further south, down into Florida, you can see here cocoa plum, uh, again, commonly planted plant. Um, again, in Florida, if any of you are familiar with shrubs in Florida or work in Florida, I mean, everything grows at, you know, great neck speed down there. So here we can see cocoa plum, the difference between our untreated area and our treated area, pretty drastic there. Again, another plumbago here in Naples, Florida, the difference between the treated or the untreated and the treated in this case. Looking at some more aggressive species here, this is Confederate jasmine. Um, this here is in Naples, Florida. Confederate jasmine that we found planted again commonly throughout the southeastern U.S. The difference between our treated and untreated in that case. Hibiscus, another commonly planted plant here. Durantha's gold mound, again down in Florida, four weeks after treatment, the amount of growth control we're seeing. Plumbago. Another common plant, this again throughout the southeastern United States that we find, just the difference in growth control, um, just phenomenal um, results that we see across species throughout the country. That's Arbicola. Here's another climbing fig. In this case here, these were sprayed. Uh, or no, excuse me, this was another soil injection here in Florida. 
where we did a soil application to reduce the amount of um, vine growth here. Pretty phenomenal uh, results here. Moving back up here a little bit more further north, but still in the southeastern U.S., uh, Nashville, Tennessee. This is Ilya Agnes. Um, I wish we could have a show of hands of folks that have to manage Ilya Agnes and just what a bear it can be to maintain. But here we're looking eight weeks after treatment. And again, you can see the difference between our untreated here on our left and our treated here. Just phenomenal growth results. And we have folks that primarily in their sites will just use Trimtech for Ilya Agnes and nothing else because it is such an aggressive growing species uh, and at high rates works so well. Uh, here we have Viburnum odor, Tisserum, another commonly planted species here, aggressive grower, again, untreated versus treated. Uh, Calusia back down in Florida, untreated versus treated, pitch apple. Sea grape, untreated versus treated. You guys are starting to get the idea here. Uh, Bougainvillea, check out that flowering there on that Bougainvillea. Uh, just incredible looking results. Again, when we look side by side, the treated versus the untreated. Uh, moving into some plants that are gonna be, we're finding more, more northern uh, areas. Abelia, this is 18 weeks after treatment. This is, uh, this is in cooperation here, as you can see there with OSU. But you can see here, our results. Boxwood, uh, uh, here we find boxwood growing all over the country. Really a common plant. Um, again, people have a lot of affection for boxwoods. This is 18 weeks after treatment, we're seeing the reduction in growth here. So just saving labor like crazy. Here's another picture of another boxwood, 18 weeks after treatment, untreated versus treated in this case here. Spirea, this is up in Minneapolis, Minnesota their difference in growth control. So the reason why we have so many pictures here um, is we really want to get the point across that no matter where you are in the country, this here being nine mark, nine bark, eight, 12 weeks after treatment in Colorado, you will have really good results when you apply uh, TrimTech as a foliar application or for vines, especially as a soil application. Here's hydrangea again, barberry. This is one of my favorite pictures here of barberry. Uh, in this case here, this was a topiary type of um, application where we are spelling out a specific word. This is a Y, and we treated the upper part of the Y and did not treat the lower part of the Y. 12 weeks after treatment, just the amount of growth control that we're seeing there. Red stem dogwood, Miss Kim lilac. You guys are starting to get the idea here. Uh, spirea, just the amount of growth control that we're seeing throughout the country across species, um, just having really great results. Rose, winter jasmine, fatinia. I'm sure you all are starting to get a little bit bored of the growth control results here. But again, to paint the picture that no matter where you are in the country, no matter what species you're dealing with, um, trim tech can be just such a great tool to help reduce that growth control. We can also use in our annuals and perennials for those that get out of control. So here's coneflower, purple coneflower, uh, up there in uh, New Jersey, this is a picture of our untreated versus our treated, more compact, the illusion of a better flower display, uh, just another addition to landscape operations. Uh, bee balm or Monarda, again, you can see our treated area versus our untreated area. And again, this is after flowering. We have this illusion of more flowering. So just some really great results here. So how does all this work? And what are the differences between type one and type two plant growth regulators? As I mentioned, TrimTech is a foliar applied type two plant growth regulator, which is what makes it so special. So how we are achieving growth control is simply by when we apply paclobutrazole, which is the active ingredient in TrimTech, the plant is, is no longer able, paclobutrazole asks the plant to not synthesize as much gibberellic acid. And gibberellic acid is responsible for cell elongation and expansion. And so from a growth control standpoint, that's how we are achieving growth control. We make an application of TrimTech, it's absorbed into the plant, and then the plant is asked not to produce so much gibberellic acid. And so our cells are simply smaller. So we're still producing the same amount of cells, same amount of leaves, same amount of flowers, though we will look here at some research that shows we might actually produce more flowers. Um, it's just now those cells are not as large. And so that's how we achieve that growth regulation and why it works so well. Now, as a side effect of not producing so much of this gibberellic acid is, um, believe it or not, some of the um, compounds that go into producing gibberellins, namely this compound called phytol, 
also goes into creating um, more chlorophyll or going into creating chlorophyll. So when we're not producing so much gibberellic acid, we have more phytol available in the plant that can go into producing more chlorophyll. So across the board, we see that plants often look more greener um, after application because of the fact that we're able to produce more chlorophyll, which is a pretty neat side effect. And we'll look at that in a moment as well. The other thing we see is that when we ask the plant not to produce so much of this gibberellic acid, it increases the production of this abscisic acid, which we can think of as a plant protection hormone. And it helps with the stimulation of root growth. Some of the things that we are really interested in here when we look at Trimtech application is it helps trigger the closing and opening of stigmata. So when plants are within drought stress, it will actually help the plant to respond to drought stress faster. Helps cells generally are, uh, helps them to um, become less dehydrated. And then also stimulate some of these phyto defense compounds. So by simply doing a foliar application of Trimtech, we see some of these secondary health benefits. And to kind of paint the picture of what this like reducing gibberellin and making it so the cells don't grow as fast, this is an example kind of what normal growth would look like and the size of our cells. So these little blocks here would represent plant cells. And down here would be a representation of after we use Trimtech or Paclobutrazol, where we have the same amount of cells, it's just those cells are now smaller. So it's the illusion of growth control because the plant is still growing. We're not completing it or we're not asking it to not grow. It's just now not growing, not necessarily as vigorously either because it's still growing. It's just those cells aren't as large. And of course, the great irony of using pruning to manage plant height is that plants respond to pruning by producing more gibberellic acid. So therefore, the harder we prune, the more gibberellic acid the plant produces and the larger growth we get. So those cells, if you were to look at those cells after pruning that are produced those sprouts, if we got under a microscope, those cells would actually be larger and longer because the plant is responding to that pruning. And so here you can see a graphic of what we are seeing here, one year of treated growth, or untreated growth versus a year of treated growth. Same amount of cells, leaves, what have you, just that new growth is simply smaller. Now there are other foliar applied plant um, growth regulators out there uh, that are labeled for landscape use. Namely, these are type one plant growth regulators. And so type one plant growth regulators actually work by asking the plant not to grow. So it blocks cell division, uh, stops mitosis. And so while they work extremely well, as you can see here in these photos here, the issue here is, and if you've worked with plant growth regulators in the past, or you've heard negative things about plant growth regulators in the past, is that they can call this burning, this cupping, this leaf distortion. Uh, this is what type one plant growth regulators. We do not see this with Trimtech or type two plant growth regulators because of the difference in the mode of actions. So if you've heard of people using plant growth regulators or if you yourself have used plant growth regulators in the past and have experienced things like this, it's probably because you were using a type one or they are using a type one plant growth regulator and the species was either really sensitive or they were using it at too high a rate. So that is the beauty of the type two plant growth regulators is again, we see secondary health benefits associated with them and not some of these negative things that we see with these other type of plant growth regulators. So how does this work? Well, it begins with um, gibberellin is produced in the subapical meristem or all of these little buds up here. So when we spray Trimtech, what we're doing is we are spraying to drip. You'll see the label states spray to drip. And why we're spraying to drip is because we wanna make sure that we're getting into this new growth. Not necessarily, it doesn't need to be new growth per se. It's not like it needs to be like fresh, brandy new growth. It just needs to be the latest growth of the plant. So we spray the leaves to drip and then we get the solution moves down onto this nice newest growth and then is translocated up into those subapical meristems. And there it goes to work to block the synthesis of gibberellins. So this is how we want to make those applications is a spray to drip, complete and total coverage because it's only locally systemic. If we miss a part of the plant, that part of the plant will grow like normal. Um, you'll also hear, see, we have written down here, we highly recommend to the point we insist that you use a non-ionic surfactant 
for this. And the non-ionic surfactant will help break up that water tension and allow that droplet to disperse over the leaf and down onto this area. So we insist upon the fact that if you use Trimtech, that you please use a non-ionic surfactant. We carry a product called Audible 90. Um, when we also have it in a little bottle where it has a pump on it and every pump would be for one gallon. So we're only mixing two milliliters per gallon of Audible 90 um, in our Trimtech solutions to achieve these results, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> As I said, it is crucial that you get full and even coverage when we make these applications. So if we miss part of the plant, the plant will grow like normal. So full and even coverage. As far as you know, a rain event or an irrigation event, as soon as the product has dried, all of that active ingredient that can be absorbed into the plant will have been absorbed into the plant. So the longer the plant is wet, the more active ingredient the plant can take in. That being said, as soon as the plant is dry, if we have a rain event, so if we spray at 9.30 a.m. and at 10 it rains and the plant's already dry, then it's already into the plant and we don't have to worry about that. So that makes flexibility of application really nice, is that, you know, as long as it's not actively raining during application or directly after application, product will move into the plant and you'll get really great results. So again, full and even coverage, spraying onto the foliage, uh, and allowing that to drip onto those stems is where we want to go. Here's the other cool thing about TrimTech and what makes it so special as a foliar application is that you can apply any time the plant is actively growing. So right up or beginning at just pre-bud break to bud break up through the entire season. As long as the plant is actively growing and it's in the size and the shape that you want it to be in, you can make those applications. And you should see at least 12 weeks of growth regulation depending upon the plant and the application rate um, and the site. Some things go into that. But you'll see here I have this graphic. This is what we commonly run into with folks is that they prune the plant hard and then they spray and they don't get regulation. Trimtech will not absorb into woody stems. So if you have a woody stem without an expressed bud associated with it, you're not going to see growth control. So when we talk about pruning an application, when to apply completely depends upon that pruning dose. And so what I mean by that is that if the plant is the size, shape, and density that you want it, <clears throat> and you just take a head shear and just clip off some wild hairs to remove like less than a percent of the foliage, you can come and spray that day and get results. If you prune harder to the point, this here is like almost a rejuvenated shrub, but if you prune harder to where you're cutting into a lot of woody stem tissue, then you need to let the plant flush back out. It doesn't need to flush out fully. It's not like it needs to be like, you know, two, three inches of flush growth. It just needs to have an expressed bud with a leaf associated with it on all of these woody stems. That's when you can come back in and spray. So we don't need to worry about a pruning event prior to application. As long as the plant is one, actively growing, and two, in the size and the shape and density that you want it, go ahead and spray. There's no need to prune before or after application. Again, I'll say it, if the plant is the size you want it to be, the height you want it to be, and the density you want to be, go ahead and spray. Don't worry about pruning beforehand. Now that being said, it's only locally systemic. So if you do a treatment and then a crew moves in and then prunes below that area into that woody tissue, then you would have removed your growth regulation and you'll have to wait for the plant to flush back out and then spray again. That's an issue we run into um, often as well is when an application has been made and then there's a miscommunication with the crews and the crew comes back through and prunes the plant. So now to look at some of this secondary health benefits. So we saw growth control. We talked about how it's achieved. Now let's look at the actual plant close up. So one thing we talked about, of course, is that improved chlorophyll production. So we're just simply freeing up resources in the plant, reallocating them so that the plant can produce more chlorophyll. So here's an example of, this is not actually Asiatic jasmine. I apologize for that. This is ligustrum. So you can see the difference here in our untreated, the chlorosis compared to our treated here with less chlorosis, slightly smaller leaf, darker green, here we also see an improvement in flowering. So this is really cool. So 
This is a picture of, this is downy jasmine in this case here. So you can see here, this is our treated area and our untreated area. No pruning, nothing's been done other than simply making a fuller application to trim tech. And you can see the difference in the amount of flowers here. I mean, you can see no flowers almost over on this site. This flight is very, um, again, full of flowers. And so we've been undergoing um, some research. As I mentioned, we're constantly doing research, figuring out how we can use these uh, more and more as tools. And so we did some work with Dr. Kim Moore at the University of Florida. And just to call out her conclusions that TrimTech kept plants smaller for 16 weeks, and these plants had more flowers and darker green foliage. So again, um, this is the University of Florida, Dr. Kim Moore, the research that we did with her stating that, you know, with application of TrimTech, we're seeing darker green leaves and more flowers compared to our untreated controls. This here is Abelia up in Maryland. So Abelia, uh, commonly used plant, can be a beautiful plant. Um, the shame of the abelia is that all these little flowers are produced on the new growth. And of course, what are we doing with new growth is that we're pruning it off to maintain that size and shape. So if we're not pruning as often, we're not pruning off as many flower buds. And so we're getting these great displays. And this is what, you know, again, our, the people that we work with, of course, the person, people making these applications, their clients are the property managers. And we're getting feedback from the applicators uh, that the property managers are just tickled with what they're seeing. Uh, seeing plants they didn't know could flower the way they were flowering, seeing plants they didn't know even flowered. In some cases here, this is another picture of a billion in Dallas, Texas. Again, you're looking at a really tight space here. You're looking at an area that's probably pruned pretty dang frequently to maintain this. It would probably would be argued that you almost never saw flowers on the Sibelian. Here it is almost white with these flowers. So pretty incredible results when we start looking at now some of these more secondary health benefits of the plant. Here we look at knockout rose in New Jersey. This is our untreated plant. This is our treated plant. Come back six weeks later. This is our untreated plant and this is our treated plant. So again, less growth, the appearance of more flowers. And again, here on our untreated plant, we're starting to see some of that, you know, chlorosis that comes on, no signs of chlorosis in our treated plant there. Here again is plumbago, and again, just look at the top of the plant, look at the difference in the amount of flowers here. So just greater amount of flowers versus our untreated. This was a neat little find. So this was a mistake almost, I guess you could say, but a happy mistake. In this case here, what we were doing is we were trying to um, assess the time it took to do pruning in these Asiatic jasmine beds with our untreated versus our treated. When we came back, what we realized is that our treated areas had less weeds. And so when we started pulling back the jasmine, we found this is in this case here, this is torpedo grass. We found that that torpedo grass had germinated. It just was over-regulated to the point where it never broke through the canopy of the jasmine. So we were able to use this as a weed suppressant in beds like this. What we were doing is we were using the appropriate rate for jasmine, but it was over-regulating those weeds. So we have reduced weed instance. And again, this is a replicated trial, and we've seen this over and over again in these landscape beds where we're actually able to over-regulate the weed species so that we're not having to go through and either do manual pulling, which of course is a huge labor issue, or come through uh, and use herbicides, which can, again, be damaging to the, um, the host plant there. More examples here of improved color. This is a yew bush or taxa species, eight weeks after treatment. Again, you can see the difference between the treated and untreated. It almost looks like Photoshop, but I assure you that it is not. This is some other neat research that we've been undertaking is that using paclobutrazol or Trimtech to reduce the instance of winter injury. So there is data, it's actually out of North Carolina uh, in Christmas tree farming that talks about when you do fuller applications of paclobutrazol, which again, Trimtech, the active ingredient is paclobutrazol, that they saw reduced winter injury in Christmas trees. So this is a photo that was just taken this year from one of our associates up there in this again, New Jersey, I believe. Well, he's from New Jersey. Um, what we're seeing here is um, boxwoods. This side was treated, this side was not treated. And all of this burn here, you're seeing all this kind of graying out or browning, tanning out, that is all associated with winter injury. 
So again, we had um, kind of a mild late winter, the plants started to come alive, and then it was hit with some you know, cold weather, sub-zero or sub-freezing weather, and burnt this foliage, winter burned this foliage. But if you look at our treated area, again, we can still see winter burn, but definitely not as much as our treated. So another novel, perhaps, way to use these um, tools, not just simply for growth regulation. We see a lot of disease resistance when we use uh, fuller applications of Paclobutrazole. In this case here, this is low growth sumac. And you can see here, this is powdery mildew. This is 12 weeks after treatment. So this obviously is our untreated section versus our treated section. And again, less growth, significantly less powdery mildew in our treated section. Here we look at Sarospora leaf spot on hydrangea. Again, you can see the instance of Sarospora leaf spot on our untreated. And again, this is just one treatment of foliar applied trim tech. We're seeing less instance here. Here's a trial from North Carolina. This now is pseudo Sarospora leaf spot on uh, abelia. And so you can see here our untreated section versus our treated section. Uh, and again, less instance of pseudo sarospirally spot in this case here. So again, this is one application, no other fungicides are used. This one was incredible to me. This is Indian hawthorn and entospermorium leaf spot. Uh, for any of you out there that deal with Indian hawthorns in your operations, you know that they are really prone to the specific disease. So here what we're seeing is an untreated plant versus a treated plant. I mean, it's just night and day. This, still to this day, this um, just blows my socks off uh, looking at this photo. So again, some of these secondary health benefits that we can see using um, these type 2 foliar applied plant growth regulators like TrimTech. So now let's segue into, so what does this all mean? So we can slow plant growth, that's great. We can make the plant look better, that's great. We can reduce the instance of disease in the landscape, that's great. We can reduce some of these drought and um, cold damage um, issues, that's great. But what does it mean to the bottom line and what does this mean to your business? Because let's face it, right now our industry is in a labor crisis. Um, I was just talking to somebody this morning that said going into the season, they are short 15 people. 15 people. That's incredible to me. So what if you can't find those 15 people? What can you do? Well, using plant growth regulators is like hiring on folks. And when people say, oh, we're trying to reduce your labor, some people look at that as a negative, like you're trying to take jobs away, which is anything less than the truth, because the problem is, is we don't have people to do the job. So by using plant growth regulators, what we're able to do is stabilize our workforce. So we're not in a crunch where we have to hire 15 people that aren't out there. It also allows us to hold on to people for a longer period of time. So that is one of the biggest benefits business-wise is that we are able to no longer have to work around when the plant is growing. We can control when the plant is growing. We can reduce the amount of labor that needs to get done out there and, again, allow us to stabilize our workforce, save money in the long run, bring on more jobs in some cases because, again, we're not having to spend so much time in pruning labor. And it's just a phenomenal tool from a business standpoint. We start looking at some of these case studies that we've been kind of working with over the past few years. In this case here, this is a trial that was done outside of Philadelphia. Um, this is Jamie Sharp, uh, formerly of the Brickman Group. In this case here, he said he found a five to one labor savings in his untreated versus his treated plants. A five to one labor save. Excuse me, that's pretty cool. This here is an example of, this is North Augusta, um, in South Carolina, just north of Augusta, Georgia, where the Masters just was. Um, so this is a municipality that's using it. So I don't know if there's anybody out there that works for municipality or with municipality. Um, but in this case here, his statement is, TrimTech has given us the best results in labor savings of any of the plant growth regulators that he uses. And it allows them to complete additional work tasks um, and bring on other sites to do. So again, able to reduce labor, and bring on more work to get done in this municipality. Here's another example where, in this case here, um, it took 
10 hours to prune these home sites. He brought that down to one and a half hours per week in this specific HOA. And again, an example of, in this case, this fellow was down four crew members. He needed four people to fill out his crew and using trim tech that allowed him to stay on top of the pruning um, and again, get the stuff done. So incredible um, work here. In this case here on this site, it would take four shearing events in 12 weeks to maintain these trees the way they needed to uh, be maintained. Using TrimTech, it took three light tip pruning events. So instead of going out there with a full crew and the hedge pruners, he's able to go out there with one guy and some hand snips and a pole snip to just snap off some wild hairs here. So incredible reduction in pruning. And one of our largest return on investment trials to date we did, in this case here, we had five independent sites in an area of central Florida. And when we did our treated versus our untreated labor um, results, so this would be, when we look at the labor, we also look at the time to make the application. So that's included in this. We found that in this case study, um, we were able to reduce pruning by 62%. So this is over these five different sites. And some, on one site, I remember clearly, because was, I was hoping it would be that for all sites, but on one site specifically, we were able to save almost 80% pruning labor. On other sites, obviously, it wasn't as much. It was more around 30%. But when you looked at all these different, these five different sites that came out to reducing pruning labor by 62%. And then we asked, well, you know, what are you doing with this um, labor? And this is where we started to get this picture of what, you know, having not having to prune so often could do for an operation. And so the one thing, the, the number one thing that these account managers came back with was they were able to spend more time on some of this enhancement work or this kind of like fine detail work, like tree pruning, raising, weeding, and herbiciding, just bed maintenance. Uh, that was the biggest thing that they found that they were able to do is basically just have more time to spend on these other parts of the contract that they would have to sacrifice quality on because of pruning. They're able to do more work there, which of course made their client happier, which helped them to get their renewals. Um, the other thing we found is they're actually able to bring on new business. Uh, again, they weren't spending so much time on these sites. They're actually able to bring on new business, which of course brought on more revenue. Um, so that was really exciting to see. Uh, and then the other things is they got less callbacks because again, their quality of work was better. Uh, and they're able to manage that backlog because again, they weren't spending so much time in labor. So just some really cool findings that we had when it came to you know this specific study here. The other thing we see, of course, is we're reducing our biomass. So um, for those of you that have to pay to dispose of green waste, whether it be by weight or by load, we're reducing the weight, number one, we're reducing the amount of loads, number two. So another kind of, um, I say intangible benefit, but when you look at a business cost here, um, you know, how much are you spending a year to get rid of green waste? Um, and again, if you're a conservationist or environmentalist, um, you know, green waste represents, you know, a source of carbon breaking down and getting into the atmosphere. So we're able to reduce the amount of carbon escaping uh, and making its way into the atmosphere. So as an example here, this is again, um, our friends at the city of North Augusta. Um, this is ground covered um, jasmine. And so our treated, when we weighed it in our section here was 260 pounds, our untreated was 520 pounds. So we almost cut the amount of weight of clippings by half in a 12 week period. So again, just some really cool results here that we can uh, see by using these. If we look into some of these other case studies real quickly, let's see here, check our time. We got plenty of time. Um, this here, we're looking at, this was a warehouse uh, complex in Seattle, Washington. Um, the shrubs that we were looking at here on this specific site were Cotoneaster and Cherry Laurel. Before applying TrimTech, it would take 300 hours per year to do this pruning. So 300 hours per year to do the pruning prior to using TrimTech. After using TrimTech, they reduced that to 72 hours per year. That's a 76% 76 76 reduction in labor, um, which equated to $4,840 in labor savings per year, plus those application costs. So for all these things, application costs has worked into this. So again, that is pretty 
incredible when you look at the possibility of using these plant growth regulators. Um, and then a quick quote, as you can see here, by using TrimTech, we went from a four-person crew down to a three and sometimes two-person crew. With minimum wage in Seattle close to 15, 15 hour, we need every labor savings tool available. So just some of the great things that we've seen. Another quick case study, this here is in uh, Washington, D.C. This is at the National Shrine. Our target shrubs piece here was Juliana Barberry. Before TrimTech, again, we're 280 hours a year. That's eight times, that's eight individual occurrences of pruning. After TrimTech, we're down to 70 hours per year and two occasions to do that pruning. And again, you can see the reduction in pruning there in the labor savings. If we ask this quote here, TrimTech has helped the plants look more natural and less woody. Again, because we're not pruning as hard anymore, we can allow that, that center of that plant to regrow, it can make the plant look a lot nicer. Uh, we're able to focus on other needs rather than pruning, and we're able to attend to the site in one single visit rather than a couple of visits uh, most of the year, which is again, pretty neat. Here we have a commercial site down in Dallas, Texas. Our key shrubs here were Laura Pedalum, Needlepoint Holly. Again, prior to TrimTech, 720 hours, after TrimTech, 180 hours. Um, pretty cool there. By using TrimTech, we were able to keep up with the mowing more. Typically, we would use four people, but we're able to drop to three because of the reduced pruning needs. Um, and here we have one or two more of these examples, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. Uh, this is an apartment town complex in Germantown, Maryland. Manhattan Euonymus was a big one here. And, and if you get, if you guys have to manage or manage Manhattan Euonymus, you know it's an aggressive growing species. Um, again, 270 hours a year down to 140 hours a year. Pretty cool stuff. Um, and in this case here, one thing that we didn't mention when we look at application is that once you get into that second year of application, we can reduce our rates. So that means, again, that's a cost savings to the applicator. Um, and again, it's less that we have to put out. Um, so in this case here, the first year they used a higher rate, second year they used a lower rate and still got the same amount of control. And then our final case study here, uh, again, in this site, they were at 800 hours per year, dropped it down to 420 hours per year. Um, and again, just a uh, great, really happy with um, what they had here as far as a return on the investment. So what does it all mean in conclusion? We're having greener plants that are more resistant to disease, more drought resistant. We're reducing our top growth by 30 to 70%, if not more. We're saving labor. One thing we didn't talk about also was safety, keeping people off of ladders with some of these larger uh, shrubs, as well as with the pruning, keeping power pruning pruners out of people's hands. We're reducing waste and we're reducing our complaints here. So pretty incredible stuff. So whether or not you're managing homeowners associations, campuses, commercial sites, resorts or hotels or cemeteries, you have opportunities to use shrub growth regulators. Um, of course, don't forget our sister product, Canvastat, um, which is also a soil applied plant growth regulator for trees and tree form things. Um, it's a great opportunity there. We do have some upcoming webinars. Um, so we have a TransTech webinar next week, um, followed by a Canvastat webinar, as we just talked about, a Dutch elm disease management webinar. Um, to find those on our website, you would simply Go to our homepage, treecarescience.com, come down to events, click on that spring webinar series, and that will take you to this page here where you can register. So with that, we will wrap up, take any questions anyone might have. So again, Matt Karst, uh, is up there in uh, Minnesota, and he'll be able to uh, read any questions that we may have. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Nice job. So getting right into this, the first question we have is, uh, does this affect diseases on boxwood positively or negatively, like volatella blight? Great question. So um, we don't have any specific 
data on volatilablite at this point. Um, we do have at least one trial in place. I believe it's actually with North Carolina State University. Um, we might have another one in place as well now, uh, looking at um, disease suppression in boxwood specifically. So while we don't have any, we don't have like a hard yes as far as volatilablite, um, you know, it would be an option to throw in there. But as far as right now, I would still be going with my standard fungicide protocol um, with that. Um, interesting note, and this is more of a piece of information because it's not labeled this way, Paclobutrazole, which is the active ingredient in Trimtect, um, was originally studied as a fungicide. So it is in the same family as um, Myclobutanol and Propiconazole. So when we look at these foliar applications, part of what we're seeing is probably these um, fungicidal effects of that and then on the outset. And then as time goes on and the plant changes physiologically, we're probably seeing some more of the physiological changes in the plant that are helping to reduce disease. So um, it can certainly help with, I would say it would likely help with volatilia management, but since we don't have any specific data on that specific disease, I would still stick with probably a, um, your standard fungicide treatments. All oh, right. Next question is, could you tank mix a spray with fungicide for things like rhizosphere on blue spruce with Trimtech and attempt to get some of the growth regulator benefits along with the fungicide sprays? So that's a great question also. So we have not tried all combinations um, of that. So certainly with um, imidacloprid foliar sprays, um, especially down in Florida, we'll mix in imidacloprid or even dinatefuran, which would be Transtec or Zytec, um, to manage uh, pests. Um, we have had some folks that have mixed in fungicides. Um, so again, I would say the standard, you know, what we always say, um, you know, do a quick little mix, jar test, make sure you don't see any precipitate form, um, make sure it doesn't separate and then spray on a small area to make sure you're not seeing any um, crazy phytotoxicity. Um, but we have done tank, tank mixes with other products um, and not seen any issues. Okay, so the next question is, what happens when you accidentally get it on the perennial shrubs that didn't mean to or the turf grass? Oh, great question. So it is a plant growth regulator, right? So it's gonna regulate anything that is green and growing uh, depending upon the rate you're using and what your off-target thing is going to be. So for better or worse, we don't see uh, over-regulation very often with Trimtect. Um, you would really have to be, one, mixing at a really high rate, or two, um, accidentally overspray a really sensitive species. Um, again, the nice thing about Trimtect versus something like Candistat uh, is that we're only seeing a few months of growth regulation. So if an accidental overspray, you don't really soak down the plant, you'll see a break regulation uh, within a few months. So it might only be a temporary effect. Same with turf, um, you know, you'll see regulation effects. We, all, we see it a lot in turf actually, and it, it represents itself as just, you know, again, very dark green turf that's not growing. Um, so it often looks like it's being, sh it, like, has a an effect of looking like the plant is shading it, like the shrub is shading the turf. So never heard any complaints from um, like a property manager, uh, but have heard, have gotten responses back from that. Um, so again, you know, your best um, option there, of course, would be to try to manage overspray and things like that, which obviously goes without saying. Um, but those are your, I guess that would be your answer. For turf, it's gonna be um, really dark looking turf that doesn't grow. <laughs> Um, and with an overspray onto, you know, another shrub species, difficult to overregulate with Trimtect, um, and it should grow out within a few months. So, and you could also, of course, prune it out as well. Like I said, it's locally systemic. So, um, if you feel like it needs to break regulation faster, you can always prune out the affected area and then fertilize to help push out new growth. All right. Thanks, Patrick. So the next question we got is, are there any human health or environmental concerns with using paclobutrazole? Great question. Um, so it is a, the label is a caution label. So it is, again, when it comes to, you know, EPA and labeling, it is the softest kind of um, warning label you can have. So again, it's caution label. As far as, 
you know, negative side effects, um, you know, with PP, it's going to be your standard PPE, um, you know, chemical resistant gloves, long pants, long shoes, or excuse me, long pants, long shirt, shoes plus socks. Um, as far as some of these other things, uh, if you look at the SDS sheet and compare it to something like aspirin, um, you would OD from aspirin before you'd OD with paclobutrazole. Not that I would suggest doing either one. Um, and as far as some other environmental fate studies, Massachusetts did a really great environmental fate study on paclobutrazole. Um, and they found it to not be um, very toxic to uh, specifically things like, you know, worms uh, and different kind of soil um, fauna. So again, you know, never call anything safe, right? But it's, uh, it's relatively mild. Um, and there should be, again, when applied correctly, mixed correctly, using proper PPE, you should see no, no negative effects or anything like that. All right, so we got one more question, and that is, what equipment would you recommend to get a good coverage uh, for a small to medium residential? Great, that's a great question. Yeah, because we didn't cover over for, uh, application equipment at all. So with that, I would recommend, I recommend um, like a gas powered or electric power sprayer all the time um, because coverage is key to have a constant pressure, again, using something like, um, you know, a small motorized backpack or, you know, a, a truck mounted um, sprayer. We just see once you get into the field and you get into practical applications that folks get better results when they use something that has a motor uh, pushing the, the product. Um, one, again, of course, is just making sure that we're getting penetration into the plant, even coverage, and then you have that constant pressure. Um, you can use like your standard pump pump backpack sprayer for sure. Um, you know, like your standard solo or, you know, we, we sell shaping backpacks um, and that's fine. Um, but we just see over a large area, people just don't seem to get as good coverage. Now, if you're going to use one of the backpack sprayers, a pump-up backpack sprayer, um, I'd have two recommendations for that. One is is we recommend using um, a fan nozzle. Uh, specifically, we recommend uh, the TJ8006 fan nozzle, uh, and we just see that we're getting the best coverage. Um, while also at the same time conserving product. And then the second part to that is um, our Chapin backpacks come with a control flow valve. And what that does is make sure that you're maintaining a constant pressure. The ones that come with our Chapins are 24 PSI. That seems to work very, very well. And so what those control flow valves do is they make sure that you're spraying at that constant pressure the entire time. So you can't, you might look on your pressure gauge and you might have it pumped up to like say 50 PSI, but it's always gonna be maintained at 24 PSI. Likewise, if the pressure should drop below 24 PSI, then the uh, flow valve will shut off. Um, and so you'll have to pressurize it back up to get it to at least 24 before you can start spraying. And so that helps with coverage as well as again, getting enough product onto the plant. All right, thanks, Patrick. I think that's it for questions. I don't have any more here in the box. Um, guess we'll just wrap it up. Thank you everyone for attending. Again, if you have any questions, uh, you can always go onto our website to see what upcoming webinars we have coming up this spring. Um, and thanks for joining, have a great day. Thanks everyone for your attention, have a great one.